This is Lecture 6, given in Stuttgart on October 8, 1922. In the ways you want to be active during your stay here, many of you are thinking, above all, about the question of education. It is not so much, perhaps, about education in the sense of ordinary school pedagogy, but the pedagogy that results when we consider that we are living in an age when many new impulses must come into the evolution of humanity, and that the attitude of the older toward the younger generation must assume a different character. One reads the fundamental character of the age as something pedagogical. In saying this, I want to describe an impression that I believe may be noticed in many of you. It seems to me important that when people look at their epoch, they should not only bear in mind the generation now young, entering the century in full youth, and its relation to the older generation that has, in the way I have described, carried over something from the last third of the nineteenth century, but they must also consider what will be the attitude of this young generation toward the coming generation, to the generation which cannot as the first, after the last third of the nineteenth century, maintain the same attitude to the nothingness that I have described? <clears throat> to the coming generation will not have what the present age has given to the younger generation through opposition toward their elders, namely enthusiasm more or less indefinite, but nevertheless enthusiasm. What will further evolve will have much more the character of a longing, of an undefined yearning, than was the case among those who derived their enthusiasm from a mood of opposition against the traditional. And here we must look still more deeply into the human soul than I have done up to now. I have already shown that in the evolution in the West, consciousness of the pre-earthly existence of the soul has been lost. If we take the religious conceptions that are closest to the development of the human heart in the West during the past centuries, we can only say, for a long time existence before the descent into a physical earthly body has been lost to human sight. Form a feeling for a moment of how utterly different it is when one is permeated with the consciousness that something has come down from divine spiritual worlds into the physical human body, has united itself with the physical human body. If nothing of this consciousness exists, there is quite a different feeling, especially about the growing child. The growing child, when looked at with this consciousness, reveals from its very first breath, or even before, what is being manifested by the spiritual world. <clears throat> Something is revealed from day to day, from week to week, from year to year. Observed in this way, the child becomes a riddle, which one approaches in a quite different way from what is possible when one thinks one is confronting a being whose existence begins with birth or conception, and who, as is said today, develops from this starting point, from this point of germination. We shall understand one another still better if I call your attention to the fact that the fundamental feeling for the riddle of the world is connected with this. You know that in former days this fundamental feeling about the world riddle was expressed in the paradigm, Man, know thyself. This saying, Man, know thyself, is about the only saying that can hold its own against the objections always arising when a solution of the world riddle is broached. Now I will say something rather paradoxical. Suppose someone found what one might call the solution of the world riddle. What would there remain to do after the moment when this world riddle was solved? Humanity would lose all freshness of spontaneous striving. All livingness in striving would cease. It would indeed be comfortless 
to have to admit that the world riddle has been solved with cognition. <clears throat> All that is necessary is to look in some book or other, there the solution is given. A great many people think thus about the solution of the world riddle. They consider the world riddle to be a question or a system of questions that must be answered by explanation, characteristics or something of the kind. Just feel the deadening effect of such a view. One feels oneself really frozen at the thought that somewhere a solution for the world riddle could be given in this way, that the solution could actually be studied. It is a terrible, horrible thought in the face of which all life freezes. But what lies in the words, man, know thyself, expresses something quite different. It really says, human, look around you at the world. The world is full of riddles, full of mystery, and the human being's slightest movement is a hint or pointer in the widest sense for the cosmic mysteries. Now one can indicate precisely where all these riddles are solved. There is quite a short formula for the indication. We can say all the riddles of the world are solved in the human being, again in the very widest sense. The human being himself or herself moving as a living being in the world is the solution to the world riddle. Let us gaze at the sun and experience one of the cosmic mysteries. Let us look into our own being and know that within myself lies the solution of this cosmic mystery. <clears throat> quote, human, know thyself and thou knowest the world, close quote. Yet this way of expressing the formula is an intimation that no answer is final. The human being is indeed the solution of the world riddle. But to know the human being, we have what is infinite before us, and so imbued with life that we will never be done. We know that we bear the solution of the world riddle within ourselves, but we also know that we shall never come to an end of what there is to search for in ourselves. From such a formula, we know only that we are not given abstract questions out of the universe that are to be answered in just as abstract a way, but that the whole universe is a question, and that the human being is an answer. We know that the question of the nature of the universe has resounded from times primeval until today, that the answer to these world questions has resounded from human hearts but that the questioning will go on resounding endlessly. Human beings must learn again living answers on into the unending, distant future. We are not directed in a pedantic way to what might be found in a book, but to the human being. Yet in the sentence, Man, know thyself, there sounds to us from ancient times when school, church, and centers of art were all united in the mysteries something that points not to what has been learned from formulas, but to that book about the world that can be deciphered, but deciphered only through endless activity. And the name of this book about the world is the human being. If the full import of what I put before you yesterday is grasped through such a change in the experiencing of knowledge. Through the attitude we have to knowledge, the spark of life will strike into the whole cognitional nature of the human being, and that is what is needed. If we picture the moral evolution of humanity up to the time when it became problematic, up to the first third of the fifteenth century, we find that the most diverse impulses were necessary to follow what I characterized yesterday as God-given commandments. When we imagine the driving forces prevalent among various peoples in different epochs, we find a great range of inner impulses arising like instincts, depending on particular conditions of life. We could make an interesting study of how these impulses to obey the old moral intuitions originate how they grow out of the family, out of the tribe, out of the inclination toward the opposite sex, 
out of the necessity to live together in communities, out of people's pursuit of their own advantage, and so on. But in the same way as the old moral intuitions have lived themselves out in historical evolution, to which we were obliged to call attention yesterday, so too the impulses mentioned no longer contain an impelling force for the human being that they once had. They cannot contain it if the self-acquired moral intuitions, of which I spoke yesterday, appear in human beings. If in the world evolution single individuals are challenged on the one hand to find moral intuitions for themselves by dint of the labor of their own souls, and on the other to awaken the inner strength, the inner impulses to live according to these moral intuitions, and then it dawns upon us that the old moral impulses will increasingly change, taking a different course. <laughs> we see emerging in the depths of the soul, although misjudged and misunderstood today by the majority of civilized humanity, two moral impulses of supreme importance. If attempts are made to interpret them, confused ideas usually result. If people want to put them into practice, they do not know, as a rule, what to do with them. Nonetheless, they are arising. As regards the inner life of the human being, the impulse of moral love, and outwardly, regarding the interaction between human beings, the moral impulse of trust or confidence in the other. Now the degree of strength of and kind of moral love that will be needed in the immediate future for all moral life was not necessary in the past. Certainly, also for former times, the saying held true, joy and love are the pinions which bear humankind to great deeds. Yet, if we would speak truly and not in mere phrases, we must say, that joy and that love which fired human beings to do this or that were only a metamorphosis of the impulses described before. In the future, pure love, working from within outward, will have to give human beings wings to fulfill their moral intuitions. Those human beings will feel themselves weak and lacking in will in the face of moral intuitions who do not kindle the fire of love for what is moral from out of the depths of their souls, when through their moral intuitions they confront the deed that should be accomplished. There you see how in our times we have a parting of the ways. It becomes evident by contrasting the atavistic elements of the older age, which play over in many ways into the present, with what is living within us like the early flush of dawn. You will often have heard those fine words Kant wrote about duty. Duty, sublime and mighty name, you embrace nothing that charms and require only submission, and so forth. These were the sternest terms in which to characterize duty. Here the content of duty stands as a moral intuition imparted from outside, and human beings confront this moral intuition in such a way that they have to submit to it. It is felt as moral when no inner satisfaction is gained from obedience to duty. Only the cold statement remains, I must perform my duty. You know Schiller's answer to Kant's definition of duty. I serve my friends gladly, but unfortunately I do it with inclination, and so it often worries me that I am not virtuous. Thus Schiller retorts ironically to this categorical imperative. <clears throat> you see, over against the so-called categorical imperative, as it comes down from former times out of old moral impulses, there stands the summons to humanity to unfold more and more out of the depths of the soul the love for what is to become action and deed. For however often in future there may resound, quote, submit to duty to what brings you nothing that will please, close quote, it will be of no avail. Just as a person of sixty years cannot behave like a little boy, so can we not live at a later age in a way that was suitable in an earlier epoch. 
Perhaps that would please people better. But that is of no account. The important thing is what is necessary and possible for the evolution of humanity. We simply cannot debate whether what Kant has said, as a descendant of very ancient times, should be carried on into the future or not. It cannot be carried on, because humanity has developed beyond it, developed in such a way that action out of love must give humankind the impulse for the future. On the one hand, we are led to the conception of ethical individualism. On the other, to the necessity of knowing that this ethical individualism must be born on the love arising from perception of the deed to be accomplished. Thus it is from the human being's subjective viewpoint. (laughs) From the aspect of the social life, the matter presents itself differently. There are people today in whom something rumbles, now no longer through a progressive evolution, but through all kinds of opinions taken from outside. They say, yes, but if you try to found morality on the individuality of the human being, you will ruin the social life. But such a statement is meaningless. It is just as sensible as if someone were to say, if it rains in Stuttgart a certain number of times in three months, nature will ruin some particular crop in the field. If one is conscious of a certain responsibility toward knowledge, one cannot imagine anything more empty. As humanity is developing in the direction of individualism, there is no sense in saying that ethical individualism destroys the community. It is rather a question of seeking those forces by which human evolution can progress. This is necessary for human evolution in the sense of ethical individualism which can hold the community together and fill it with real life. Such a force is confidence, confidence between one human being and another. Just as in our inner being we must call upon love for an ethical future, so we must call upon confidence in the relationship of human beings with each other. We must meet the human being in such a way that we feel each to be a world riddle a walking world riddle. Then we shall learn in the presence of every human being to unfold feelings that draw forth confidence from the depths of our soul. Confidence in an absolutely real sense, individual, unique confidence, is the hardest to wring from the human soul. But without a system of education, a cultural pedagogy which is directed toward confidence, Civilization can progress no further. In the future, humanity will have to realize the necessity to build up social life on the basis of confidence. Human beings will also have to experience the tragedy when this confidence cannot develop in the proper way in the human soul. Oh, my dear friends, what people have ever felt in the depths of their souls when they have been disappointed by a human being on whom they had relied. All such feelings will in future be as nothing compared with the tragedy when, with an infinitely deepened feeling of trust, human beings will tragically experience disillusionment in their fellow beings. It will be the bitterest thing, not because people have never been disappointed, but because the feeling of confidence and disillusionment will be infinitely deepened in the future because one will build to such a degree in the soul upon the joy of confidence and the pain of the inevitable mistrust. Ethical impulses will penetrate to the depths of the soul where they will spring directly from the confidence between person and person. Just as love will fire the human hand, the human arm, so that it draws the strength from within to do a deed, so there will flow the mood of confidence from outside in order that the deed may find its way from the one human being to the other. The morality of the future will have to be grounded on the free moral love arising from the depths of the human soul. Future social action will have to be steeped in confidence. For if one individuality is to meet another in a moral way, above all, an atmosphere of confidence will be necessary. So we anticipate an ethics 
a conception of morality that will speak little of the ethical intuitions of old, but will emphasize how human beings must develop from childhood so that there may be awakened in them the power of moral love. Much will have to be given in the pedagogy of the future by teachers and educators through what educates effectively without words. In education and teaching there will have to be imparted much of that knowledge which is not an abstract indication of how humanity consists of this or that, but which leads us over to the other human being in such a way that we can have the proper confidence in that person. Knowledge of the human being, but not a knowledge that makes us cold toward our fellow human beings, but that fills us with confidence. This must become the very fiber of pedagogy for the future. <clears throat> for we have to give weight again, but in a new way, to what once was taken seriously, but is so no longer in the age of intellectualism. If you go back to Greece, you will find that the doctor in his medical art, for example, felt extraordinarily related to the priest and priests felt themselves related to the doctor. Such an attitude can be seen dimly and somewhat chaotically in the personality of Paracelsus, who was and still is so little understood. Today we relegate to the sphere of religion the abstract instruction that leads away from real life. For in religious instruction we are told that a person is without the body in a way that is singularly foreign to life. Over against this stands the opposite pole in civilization, where everything brought forth by our own time is kept far from the realm of religion. Who today sees in healing, for instance, any trace of a religious act, an act in which permeation by the Spirit plays a part? Paracelsus still had a feeling for this. For him the religious life continued on into the science of healing. It was a branch of the religious life. This was so in olden times. The human being was a totality, for what a person had to perform in the service of humanity was permeated by religious impulses. We must strive to permeate life again with this religious character, however in quite a different way. Not through God-given moral intuitions, but those we have developed ourselves. This must be made evident first in the sphere of education and teaching. Confidence between one human being and another, the great demand of the future, must permeate social life. <clears throat> if we ask ourselves what one needs the most in order to be a moral human being in the future, we can only answer, you must have confidence in the human being. Now when children come into the world, that is to say, when human beings come out of pre-earthly existence and unite with their physical bodies in order to use them as instruments on earth between birth and death, when human beings confront us as children and reveal their souls to us, what must we bring to them in the way of confidence? Just as surely as children from their first movement on earth are human beings, just as surely is the confidence we bring them different from the confidence we bring to adults. When we meet children as teachers or as a member of the older generation, this confidence is transformed in a certain respect. The children come into earthly existence from a pre-earthly world of soul and spirit. What we observe when we look at what reveals itself in them in a wonderful way from day to day permeating the physical out of the world of soul and spirit may be called in the modern sense of the word the divine. We need again the divine which leads human beings out of pre-earthly into the present just as through their bodily nature they are led onward in earthly existence. When we speak of confidence between human beings in the moral sphere and apply it to education we must specialize and say, we confront the child who has been sent down to us by the divine spiritual powers, and for whom we should be the solvers of all riddles, with confidence in God. Yes, in face of the child, confidence in the human being becomes confidence in God. 
In the future, what works in a more neutralized way from person to person will of itself assume a religious nuance in relation to the child or to young people generally who have to be guided into their development in the world. There we see how through actual life morality is transformed back into religiousness that expresses itself in everyday life. In olden times all moral life was a special part of the religious life, for in the religious commandments moral commandments were given at the same time. With such things humanity has passed through the epoch of abstraction. Now, however, we must again enter the epoch of the concrete. We must feel, once again, how the moral becomes the religious. And in future the moral deeds of education and instruction will have to shape themselves in a modern sense into what is religious. For pedagogy, my dear friends, is not merely a technical art. Pedagogy is essentially a special chapter in the moral actions of human beings. Only the person who finds education within the realm of morality, within the sphere of ethics, discovers it in the right way. What I have described here as a specifically religious nuance of morality receives its right coloring if we say life stands before us as a riddle. The solution of the riddle lies in the nature of the human being. Indeed it does lie there. But anyone who teaches has to work unceasingly, in a living way, on the solution of this riddle. (laughs) When we learn to feel how in education we are working unceasingly on the solution of the world riddle, we stand quite differently in the world from what would have been the case had we sought for solutions merely by means of head knowledge. In regard to the feeling about education with which you may have come here, the important thing is to carry away with you into the world this special aspect of pedagogy. This feeling will enable you to stand in the world in such a way that will lead you not only to ask what tragedy has resulted for the young who had to follow the old, you will also ask, looking into the future, what living forces must I release in myself to look rightly upon those who are coming after me. They in turn will look back to those who were once there. A youth movement in whatever form, if it considers life in a fully responsible way, must have a Janus head. It must not only look at the demands the young make on the old, but also be able to look at the still undefined demands raging toward us with tremendous power, demands that the coming youth will make upon us. Not only opposition against the old, but a creative looking forward is the right guiding thought for a true youth movement. Opposition may, to begin with, have acted as a stimulus to enthusiasm. The power of deed will only be bestowed by the will to work, the will for creative forming within the present evolution of humanity. the end of Lecture 6.